everyone, this is a video tutorial on the Wacker process mechanism description as requested by one of my subscribers. So I'm calling this a mechanism description because the Wacker process is one where the mechanism hasn't actually fully been uh, figured out at this point. So there's more an ability to understand what might be happening or why things may be happening, but none of the arrows are very well described at this point. So over here, this is what the process looks like. Uh, I think it looks kind of terrifying, um, but this is every step. So you can see that there's about 10 steps that are occurring um, and each one of them has its own uh, name. So a complex formation, alkene coordination, ligand exchange, etc. Okay, so let's take a look at the very first step of this process. So over here, what we're going to do is we're going to take PDCL2 and we're going to convert it over to PDCL4. So basically what's going to happen is we're going to have a lot of Cl- in the solution and it'll be able to coordinate additionally to that palladium that we have. So in the first case, palladium is coordinated to two Cl- ions and now it'll be coordinated to four of them. The reason for that is the solvent that we're using is water. It's an important part of this process. And if here we look at this, this is water insoluble. So it's not going to be too helpful if it's not able to actually dissolve into the aqueous solution. So when we convert it over to PDCl4, this is now water soluble. And so now it can easily participate in this aqueous solution that we have. Let's look at step two. Okay, so now if we take a look at step two, we're talking about alkene coordination. So remember, when we talk about coordinating with a metal, that means that you're sharing electrons with that metal. So over here, we have the PDCl4 that we had made in the previous step, and here is our terminal alkene. So remember, in the Wacker process, you must be using a terminal alkene. And what's going to happen is that these pi electrons are what are going to be used to coordinate with that metal. So if you take a look at this over here, you'll see that this line is actually sitting in the middle of those two carbons, and that's actually how it's supposed to be. Now, technically speaking, one of those carbons is actually going to be the one uh, that gets to use the electrons and share them with the palladium. But in terms of what we show here, it's going to be sitting in the middle because both carbons are participating in that pi bond. So as you can see over here, this is the compound that we have formed um, for the coordination of an alkene. Okay, so let's take a look at step three, which is the ligand exchange. Remember, a ligand is either the atom or compound that is coordinated or attached to the metal in the compound that we're looking at. So in this case, we're going to exchange the chloride ligand for a water ligand. The more water that you have in the solution, the more often you'll see this exchange happen. And that's pretty much all that's happening in step three. Let's take a look at step four. Okay, so in step four, we're going to see a nucleophilic attack. So now there aren't any arrows for this one that people typically have to know because the mechanism is still not totally understood here. So it's sometimes thought to be intermolecular. Other evidence has shown it to be intramolecular. Basically, what you want to understand is a water molecule, either from within the molecule or separately, is going to come and interact with this compound that we have here, and we're going to deprotonate in this process as well. So what's going to happen is all of these portions stay the same. It's this area right here, the alkene, that's going to be affected. Now remember, when you're looking at an alkene that is coordinated, we show it kind of attached in the very middle of these two uh, the pi bond sections between those carbons. But in reality, one of those two carbons is going to be attached to the palladium and the other one will be a more electron deficient. So now in terms of stability, it would be much more stable for this carbon to have the primary hold of those electrons because the partial positive would be better on a secondary position than a primary position. And that knowledge may help you understand why it would be that the OH is going to preferentially attach to this carbon rather than that carbon. Think in terms of there being some kind of partial positive intermediate and we always know that we want to have the most stable intermediate and tertiary is better than secondary is better than primary. So in this case, our options are either a primary carbon or a secondary. So rather have it on the secondary position, which means if that was partially positive, that would be the better attack point for the water. So therefore, we're going to see the OH group add to that carbon rather than that primary one that we have over there. Let's take a look at step five. Okay, so now let's take a look at step five of this process. So this is actually going to be the rate determining step. And what essentially is happening is that one of the chlorines is getting kicked off. The really important thing in this step to realize, though, is that means then that the palladium is being reduced. In this case here, it's a PD2+. Plus, and after the removal of that chlorine ion, you're going to have PD plus left over. So that's the point of what's happening on this step. Let's move on to step six. 
So in step six, what we're gonna see is a beta hydride elimination. So over here, let's just get a handle on what those words mean. So when we're talking about beta, we're talking about the position relative to where the metal is. So our metal here is palladium. The carbon immediately adjacent to it, that's our alpha. Beta is the carbon that's adjacent to the alpha. So here we have palladium, alpha, beta, and on that beta carbon, we're gonna see our hydrogen. So this is the beta hydride that we're talking about. Now, the reason that it says hydride is because hydrogen is called hydride when it has a negative charge because it's gonna take both of the electrons away with it. So what that's gonna to prove to be is that this bond here is gonna be shifted down to make a double bond between these two carbons. And when that happens, this hydride is gonna be eliminated because this carbon would have too many bonds otherwise. And it's gonna be eliminated to make a bond with the palladium as we see right over here. Now I did very purposely stick that double bond right in the middle of that wedge that we have there because remember the pi bond is coordinating. I think that this can be a little bit confusing because typically in a mechanism when we see a bond break this way we want to separate the components but because the pi bond is able to coordinate we will still show the palladium attached to those carbon positions. Let's take a look at our next step. Okay, so in step seven, what we're gonna see is a one, two insertion. So in a chemical reaction, insertion means that there's this bond that already exists and some other compound or chemical entity is gonna come in and kind of place itself in between the two atoms that are part of that bond. So that's what we're gonna see happening here. So what we look at is we have this palladium, right? And we show this bond sitting between the pi bond because it's the pi bond electrons that are going to be coordinating with the palladium. In reality though, the palladium would be attached to one of those because two electrons are always shared between two atoms. So if we show that over here in this case, you're gonna see some dots that are formed. So now I've color coded it. There are the dots here between the palladium and the hydrogen and the pi bond between the two carbons. Those are the bonds that already existed, but those are also the bonds that we're gonna lose in order to complete this insertion. So these bonds start to break, but then based on the way it's orientated in space, there are bonds that can then form between this carbon and this hydrogen and this carbon and that palladium. So the black uh, bonds that we have are gonna start to disappear and the red bonds are gonna come up and form. So those are gonna be where we see the new bonds. So as you can see over here, this compound right here has inserted itself in between the bond that used to exist between the palladium and the hydrogen. And that's how we come up with this final product of step seven. Let's take a look and see what happens to it in step eight. So in step eight, we're gonna see another beta elimination happening off of that palladium. So over here we have our palladium and then we have our alpha position and then this oxygen is beta to that carbon. And so this hydride sitting on that beta position is going to move over to the palladium and this bond here will move up and make a double bond, much like one of the earlier steps we looked at. So at the end of that here, you'll have a hydrogen put back on the palladium and then this palladium coordinating to that double bond between the carbon and the oxygen. Let's take a look at step nine. Okay, so in step nine, we're looking at a reductive elimination. What that basically means is we're going to eliminate all of the ligands off of the palladium, and in that process, we're gonna reduce it down to an oxidation state of zero. At this point right here, it is currently at an oxidation state of plus one. So we're removing all of the ligands off of it, and once we've removed all of those ligands, you'll see that the palladium has an oxidation state of zero. So up through step nine, we're trying to make our product that we want, which is the methyl ketone. The remaining steps in this process are to regain the plus two oxidation state on the palladium. So let's take a look at how that happens in step 10. Okay, so we've made it to the end of the process, step 10. All step 10 is about is regenerating our catalyst. So over here we have the palladium with an oxidation state of zero that we were left with at the end of step nine. This palladium is gonna undergo a reaction with two units of copper two chloride. When these two come together, PdCl2 is one of the products and copper one chloride is the other. We need to keep regenerating this copper two chloride in order to allow this reaction to continue. So then this here will come into reaction with oxygen and hydrochloric acid. Out of it will come water and then the regenerated catalyst that regenerates the first catalyst. And that's everything that happens in this process.